reading from Luke chapter 9 beginning at verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. The title of this talk is Winning by Losing. Three vicars were talking about problems in their churches and the first vicar said, Do you know, since summer started I've had nothing but trouble with mice in my church. I've tried everything, noise, spray, cats, and nothing seems to scare them away. The second vicar then said, same for me. I've got hundreds living in the basement of my church. I've set traps and even called an expert to get rid of them, but they won't go away. With a grin on his face, the third vicar said, I had the same problem. So I baptised all mine and made them members of the church. I haven't seen one back since. The demands 
made by Jesus in the second half of this passage feel like they would drive many people away. No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I do recall being uh, in a house group in my early years as a Christian. It was very helpful. And one of our group, when the issue of the cost of following Jesus arose, had a story that she liked to tell. She repeated it several times. The story was of a faithful pastor that she knew. Um, this gentleman had had a lifelong ministry and was now ready to retire. What do I actually need to live? He asked himself. And following that question, his decision was to sell his house and to give all the proceeds of the sale to the church that he'd been pastor at. And then he bought a caravan and lived on a piece of ground next to the church. Now, at the time, this was in presented as an inspiring story, giving everything for Jesus. Now that um, I'm a vicar myself, I'm just hoping that nobody wants me to do that. But a lot has been written about the cost of discipleship. Uh, you might have heard stories like that one or sermons that demand Jesus wants everything. Martin Luther wrote, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing and suffers nothing is worth nothing. It's a different way of saying discipleship is winning by losing. I agree with this, that there will be times when our decisions are unpopular or our values feel as though they are the opposite of the surrounding culture, that much at times will be demanded of us. In this passage, Luke writes, Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. There is a sense of determination, of perseverance, and a willingness to endure whatever is thrown at Jesus. In the example of Christ, we see this as he goes on to the cross and all the horrors that it contained. Now, certainly Christ said, pick up your cross if you want to follow me. But the danger is we make hanging on in the face of adversity our primary model for understanding following Jesus. In this passage, as is often the case, as we enter Luke's narrative, Jesus is on the move. The theme of journey runs throughout this gospel. This is a transition moment on the journey. Jesus turns and sets his face in a new direction towards Jerusalem. And perhaps because of the sense of determination and cost that surrounds this in this passage, we're a little bit drawn from another gem that Luke hides in this passage. The passage certainly does convey the cost, what we lose as we follow Jesus, but their victory, the victory, the winning, is also in there as well. Let me explain. Three times in two verses, Luke mentions Jesus's face. The first two are clear in the text. The third is actually hidden due to translation issues, but it is there. Three times Jesus men uh, Luke mentions Jesus's face. When something is mentioned three times in scripture, uh, we're alerted that this is important. So what's Luke saying? We've already noted that Jesus turned his face and sets it. Any Jew reading this would immediately make the connection, would immediately see the resonance with the ironic or priestly blessing from Numbers. You will have probably heard it. It's repeated and has been repeated over 2,000 years of church history. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Aaronic blessing is the blessing that Aaron and his sons were to speak over the people of Israel, God's people. It's recorded in Numbers chapter 6. For ancient Israel, this expressed the highest state of blessing that the nation would enjoy as they were faithful to God. But for us, in light of the finished work of Jesus Christ, he has already granted us all of the things that are asked for in that blessing. And they have been granted on a permanent basis. And so Luke is alerting his reader to the God who blesses. His face is shining on us. His attention is on us with a purpose and direction. American pastor Eugene Peterson in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, wrote this. One of the most interesting and remarkable things Christians learn is that laughter does not exclude weeping. Christian joy is not an escape from sorrow. Pain and hardship still come, but they are unable to drive out the happiness of the redeemed. We see in this passage, passage the cost of being a disciple of Jesus. But there is also this undertone of blessing, of favour, of a God who blesses. That somehow, at the paradox of discipleship, is that as we lose, we win. Um, a lady came into church this week on Thursday morning. We had um, our midweek communion service, a very small service, just a small congregation there. She's probably in her 90s. She came in with two walking sticks, very slowly, one step at a time. It was hot outside. She was clearly breathless. It had taken a lot just to get to the door of the church. I greeted her and she appeared to be mumbling. I'm sorry, I can't tell what you're saying. As I looked at this lady in her 90s, it was clear that she'd used every ounce of her strength just to get into church. I thought perhaps she was just a bit incoherent and not really making any sense. She said to me, oh no, I'm singing A Pilgrim Was I, an old hymn to keep me going. The words of this hymn, A Pilgrim Was I, are based on Psalm 23. Just to get to church, she was repeating, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Following Jesus is winning by losing. We give up our lives, there will be a cost, but as we do, we win. Eugene Peterson again. Endurance is not a desperate hanging on, but a travelling from strength to strength. Blessing is at the end of the road, and that which is at the end of the road influences everything that takes place along the road. A joyful end requires joyful means. Bless the Lord. And so to finish, I want to use a paraphrase of this ironic blessing. If it helps, use your imagination. Close your eyes and consider Jesus as he sets his face towards the rejection and pain of Jerusalem and Calvary. Whatever you are going through at the moment, if it feels costly, if it feels difficult, for a moment imagine Jesus saying these words of blessing, drawn from the ironic blessing, straight to you. This is the way you shall bless the children of God. Say to them, Yahweh, God, adores you and gives you power to succeed and prosper. He cares for you as a shepherd does his sheep. God devotes his entire being to showing you favour. 
and gives you undeserved grace. God welcomes you into his presence and with his authority as creator, places you in complete fulfilment. And they shall put my name and glorious reputation upon these the children of God, who are my family, and I will bless them. Let us give up our lives, lose our lives for Christ, and in the process receive the blessings of God. Amen. Mm -hmm.